Hi, Shannon Seiler here, providing you with some noteworthy information on Roberto Rossellini's 1945 Italian film, Rome Open City, the legendary film that brought Italian neorealism to the forefront of cinema. As described in the Criterion Collection, Rossellini's film, quote, marked a watershed moment in Italian cinema as it garnered awards around the globe and left the beginnings of a new film movement in its wake, unquote. Unlike the earlier fascist white telephone films of the 30s and early 40s, Rossellini's film did not work to persuade, but to give the viewers an awareness about everyday life, specifically everyday life in Rome, Italy, under Nazi occupation during World War II. Rossellini's sober and steady eye worked to expose the humanity found throughout the actions and experiences of th those who were part of the resistance, working to fight the Nazi occupation. The documentary-like style of Rome Open City was a new cinematic style of film, which began to catch the attention of filmmakers and filmgoers worldwide. Beginning in 1943, Rome's status as an open city spread it of air raids and combat. But in reality, the Nazis occupied the Eternal City, imprisoning its residents inside. Eventually, in 1943, the Allies liberated Rome of Nazi occupation. Roberto Rossellini's Rome Open City was created only weeks after this very liberation and while the war continued on. And the bare framework of a script was actually created during the Nazi occupation. Working to produce a film in the economic turmoil following World War II was anything but easy for Rossellini, as he explains in an interview that he had no equipment, no studio, and no raw film stock. He actually had to buy scraps of film from, from photographers because materials were so sparse. In an introduction to world cinema, you will notice that Rossellini is quoted describing the difficulty of creating the film as he states, quote, In order to pay for my film, I sold my bed, then a chest of drawers, and a mirrored wardrobe. Rome Open City was shot silent not by choice, but by necessity. Also, the Allied authorities had only given us a permit to produce a documentary film." Unquote. However, these inconveniences did not upset Rossellini as it might another film producer of his time, because Rossellini wasn't worried about creating a luxurious film artifice, but creating a sincere and direct film about how individuals dealt with a certain action of society. He was more worried about getting his point across than creating a lush mise-en-scene. In interview, Rossellini describes his personal reasons for creating a documentary-like film in such dire circumstances with such minimal film materials as he states, quote, After all we'd seen and been through, the destruction of the war, we couldn't afford the luxury of making up fictional stories. The important thing was to take a serious look at things around us, unquote. Rossellini did just this as he creates a deeply humanist work in which he gives equal weight to the everyday concerns of individuals as they simply try to live, and to the urgency of the behind-the-scenes struggle against the Nazis. The film is divided into two parts, with the first half focused on the daily lives of a loose group of resistance fighters living in Rome. One of, of the main characters, Francesco, works for a communist newspaper and helps coordinate the activities of a group of militant anti-Nazi fighters, led by his friend Giorgio, played by Marcello Piero. Francesco's fiance, the widow Pina, played by Anna Minani, is involved in the struggle as well. Despite being pregnant, she helps incite riots against the shops that controlled food rations and keep the people of the city from getting enough to eat. Even her son, Marcello, played by Vito Anacarico, wins the fight as part of a gang of kids led by a crippled boy who go on late night bombing runs against the Nazis. In the film's second half, Rossellini shifts his focus onto the attempted escape and capture of Giorgio and Don Pietro by the Gestapo officer Bergman, played by Harry Feist. The heroine sequence where the Gestapo question and then tortured Giorgio, while the priest is forced to watch, occupies much of the second half of the film. It is a powerful testament to Rosalini's belief in the power of the human spirit and the strength of the men who dedicated themselves to the resistance. 
In a sense, Roman City is a portrait of a whole community, a whole people, united in opposition to the evils of the Nazis, with everyone contributing to the fight, even the children. The documentary-like manner in which these stories of everyday individuals are revealed throughout the film helped to make Rome open city in an exemplar Italian neorealist film. In the 1930s, fascism trained the generation of Visconti, Fellini, and De Sica, and even Rossellini to produce fascist propaganda films. Between 1941 and 1943, Rossellini created his first feature films, a trilogy for Vittorio Mussolini, who was in charge of Italian cinema. However, Italian neorealism was born in 1943 in reaction to these propagandist films that were pushed by fascists of the 1930s. In the spring of 1945, Mussolini was executed and Italy was liberated from German occupation. This period, known as the Italian Spring, was a break from old ways and an entrance to a more realistic approach when making films. Italian neorealist films worked to depict the difficult economic and moral conditions of post-World War II Italy, representing changes in the Italian psyche and the conditions of everyday life, including poverty, oppression, and desperation. Rome Open City was not the first Italian neorealist film, but it was the one that caused a stir and became its manifesto. Rossellini's realism negates any epic sweep or heroic gestures. His characters perform ordinary actions in the course of daily life, while Rossellini's sole interest is the suffering of men and women, which he films humbly. Rome Open City established several of the principles of neorealism, illustrating the struggle of the Italian people living under the German occupation of Rome, and doing what they can to resist the Nazi occupation. The children throughout the film play a key role in this, and their presence at the end of the film is suggestive of their role in neorealism as a whole, observers of the difficulties of today who hold the key to the future. While the content and plot of Rossellini's film is characteristic of Italian neorealism, his manner of filming this content is also exemplary of Italian neorealism. Rossellini's Rome Open City is legendary for its use of exterior locations and exposure of the vivacity of street life and hazard that the Romans had to lie under during Nazi occupation. Rossellini had a deliberately new approach in the depiction of landscape. He did not romanticize landscape, but presented its ordinariness to viewers. He worked to get rid of ceremony and pretense and move towards commonality and humanistic values, which are even more clearly identifiable in the individual's actions taking place in the haphazard city that has been thrown into chaos itself. As mentioned, Rossellini was focused on allowing the audience to feel this harsh reality, no matter how rudimentary the elements of film equipment he had to work with were. In an interview, he has noted saying, quote, If the film stock had expired and film was grady, then good, better to remember, unquote. Though he did not have much lighting equipment, the lighting choices throughout the film were deliberate. One example of this deliberate lighting is found in the torture scenes. The clear-cut shadows on the wall behind Bergman are deliberate as they resemble a cross. These shadows are supposedly cast by a window, however. Again, even if shooting conditions were particularly difficult, the images we see were deliberate and planned. Another example of just how deliberate Rossellini was in particular aspects of his film is found in the makeup of Manfredi and the torture scenes. Rossellini went to great lengths to bring in a famous sculptor, Ninon Francina, to create an image of Manfredi that was realistic and yet symbolic of Christ on the cross. And again, though it is noted that Rossellini explained it was very important to not worry too much about shots and camera angles, but to focus on whether or not the film was getting the point across, he did spend time making sure certain scenes were shot at specific angles. For example, in the scene in which the Nazis evacuate apartment buildings, Rossellini filmed with long shots from high shots looking down and then changes to a type of documentary footage as he cuts to ground level with Pina. Rossellini then works to frame the density of bodies found in the large crowd of onlookers. 
The shot is juxtaposed as a shot rings out at the end of the scene, and Pina falls suddenly to the ground. The shot here reveals Pina in a simple, open expanse of cement. As it is pointed out, Rosalini is playing with frame here as it is empty or full with life activity. Rosalini made his film without delay at the end of World War II, and it ended up being the perfect moment in history to introduce Italian neorealism internationally. At Cannes in 1946, Rome Open City won the Grand Prix along with 10 other films. Though it took a while for the film to catch on, first in France, then back in Italy, and then in America, it was and still is considered the first great European film on the resistance. The period between 1943 and 1950 in the history of Italian cinema is dominated by the impact of neorealism. Italian neorealism films, specifically Robert Rossellini's War Trilogy, largely impacted not only Italian film but also French New Wave cinema, the Polish film school, and ultimately um, films all over the world. Finally, I think it is fitting to end with Martin Scorsese's description of Roberto Rossellini as the father of all of us.